Good morning, everyone. So today will be uh, an entirely different day from the previous ones because we will go to seismology. So um, seismologists among you, for some of you, it may be, uh, pa some parts may be easy, but they are meant, of course, for the other ones. While you may get more food uh, uh, along the way from, from the expert seismologists that we call to, to to lecture today. So um, we will also have a lot of exercises, and the exercises contain a software that you, we hope you might be able to use also in your future. Um, so I'll give the word to Tarsten. OK. So good morning again. And as Eleonora already announced, uh, we slightly, slowly moved to seismology, but actually be, my first presentation here is still on a subject that was heavily discussed yesterday on the fluid field fracture grow, or how do dikes move and grow? So these are general questions. How do fluid field cracks grow in general? Um, what can we learn from the shape and the growth path, especially? And how this is linked to, to induced seismicity, to seismicity in general? So I will concentrate a bit more on the basics uh, in terms of the theoretical concepts. In this presentation, directly after my presentation, Cindy will show examples on uh, dikes and in induced seismicity, much more than I do. So the first section, how do fluid field factors form and grow? And we need to have a look into theoretical concepts for this, but before, I have at least also one nice figure of a picture, photo of a dike. This is a dike in Germany, in the Eiffel. And uh, I mean, you're all experts here. You have seen a lot of dikes on the poster outside. You see a very nice example. Here's another one. You see the dimension of magmatic dikes. The opening can be up to several meters. Length overall to up to several kilometers. I like this figure because if you carefully look to the outdrop here, you can also see indications of faulting. And it's, I mean, we don't know for sure, but it's likely that this faulting occurs during the dike intrusion. And this is exactly the subject of today. How do these, how is this emplacement formed and how do the dikes grow? But also how uh, are the uh, earthquakes linked to this process? And we, yesterday, we have also already discussed the problem of magmatic reservoirs. And in the second part of my presentation, I will concentrate also on uh, geometry that is more presented by this sketch here, where you, where you try to couple also to the reservoir, because large dikes, kilometers long, as in this sketch, for instance, for lateral uh, intrusions or rifting episodes, they have to be fed from large magmatic reservoirs, as seen here. If you look to the, well, you, you, you can find examples of uh, exposed uh, solidified magmatic dikes at the surface. This is uh, a figure taken from Dilani and Pollard, where a complete segment of a dike has been exposed and, and the opening shape has been measured. And this gives a good impression. It's in scale how this uh, possibly looks. And you see it's, it's not a planar. Cracked. You see there's a small curvature inside, but it's not very large, actually. So the first question is, how, what is the expected theoretical shape of opening? And maybe many of you know this, and I will not go into the equations, uh, only give a reference in principle. This is a theoretical concept, for instance, has been, it has been derived for two-dimensional parallel uh, infinite cracks, as seen here so-called Griffith cracks. And the geometry is nicely sketched in this figure, which is taken from Pollard and Siegel in a review paper, 87. Um, and the, the main concept of this type of simply of, of 2D crack is that the length in one dimension is infinite. This is the crack tip here. This is the, here it's called width, or we often say length of the crack. Half length is A. And, uh, and then you can uh, derive equations how the displacement uh, and the stress field changes if 
this uh, this crack is emplaced in a in a homogeneous uh, rock. Um, important is to recognize that here we go to to crack problems. These are boundary value problems. So we cannot uh, start with uh, equations of elastic continuum. In principle, we need to, to solve the, the combined problem of sources of these cracks in an elastic medium. And the boundary conditions are very important. And they are uh, given in the sense that the um, stress is continuous at the surface over the crack plane. And uh, this figure also, if you look carefully, diff distinguish bit between the um, remote stress or the regional stress given that is given far away from the crack and the uh, stress, which is, for instance, the pressure inside this crack, if it's fluid field, uh, that is acting on the surface. And responsible for the opening shape is the difference between the um, confining or stress here and the remote stress, which is, for instance, described <coughs> in the term driving stress. So in my notation here, this is given by this delta sigma, the driving stress. And, uh, and this is actually the boundary condition. So if you know the driving stress, you can estimate the opening shape or the shearing shape of such a crack. Um, maybe I should uh, also um, give a note or, or indicate that you have three options of driving stresses. One is normal stress, and the other two are shear stresses either in this or the other directions. And these are associated with three types of opening mode one to mode three, as you, many of you probably also know. So the equations of opening can be derived. And for such a simple crack, if the uh, driving stress is constant, for instance, a constant internal pressure in a medium without any remote stress, um, then the opening shape is um, plotted here is elliptical, and the equation for the opening is seen here. So here you see the half length of the crack. These are elastic modules, and these are the driving stresses. If it's a mode one, which is an opening crack, it's sigma one, and these are the, one, the ones associated with the in-plane shear and tearing mode, so anti-plane shear crack. And this is the opening. So it's plotted here. You see three curves, a comparison between analytical and numerical methods. And, um, and this is the crack tip. Um, this is the opening is also associated with a small rotation, if you look here. So this is more or less what we have seen in this figure, in this uh, geological outdrop. But more of interest for our purpose, for the question of how do cracks grow, is, is the stress. So from this equation, you can also derive stress fields. For instance, uh, very much of interest is the stress field at the crack tip. And there you, you find for this Griffith cracks, there's a stress singularity. Um, this is the crack tip. In this, and, and again, we have uh, analytical solution and numerical solutions. But important is that here, the stress uh, goes to infinity. In theory, in this uh, linear elastic um, uh, fracture theory, it's really infinity. So there's a stress singularity. And the stress singularity can be approximated at the crack tip by this formula. And uh, Interesting is that it, this is uh, more or less for all types of cracks, always the same shape in this approximation. And therefore, uh, parameters have received special um, attention. Um, you see that the stress, the stress singularity very close to the tip is expressed by a strength. This is a factor in front of the singularity. Then there's always this 1 over R1 singularity. And R1 is measured from the crack tip in this case. So the distance to the crack tip. So it shows how quickly the singularity attenuates. And then there's a shape factor. This can vary for different modes of crack, but cracks. But important is that the strength of the singularity can be measured by a parameter, which is defined as stress intensity factor. And this stress singularity, or the strength, the stress intensity factor, in principle, defines whether a, a crack can be stable or not. If this is too large, much larger the stress singularity than the tangential strength of the rock, then the crack would grow and would be instable. And I mean, the stress intensity factor can vary a bit. For this simple crack with a constant driving stress, it is given here. But important, uh, and it always depends on the driving stress in a linear manner. 
but it also depends on the length of the crack. And this is an interesting observation because it means the longer the crack becomes, if you keep the driving stress constant, the internal pressure, for instance, the larger the stress singularity becomes and the more instable this crack would be. So this is something that is possibly unexpected. Okay, we have um, these 2D Griffith cracks and know all the theory for those. But uh, in reality, it's clear that fluid field fractures are typically 3D fractures. And for instance, a penny-shaped crack or a circular crack or elliptical crack is much more realistic. Here you see also a comparison to an observation. This was a hydrofracking experiment in Central Australia in the Cooper Basin. You see seismicity, and this uh, confirms very much. This is a cross-section, but if you look overall to the seismicity, it confirms very much that this uh, fracture was uh, growing in an elliptical or penny-shaped mode. Um, the, um, uh, it is yeah, fortunate or um, simply a fact that the equations of, for the stress intensity factor for the opening do not change a lot if you go from the, from the Griffith crack to the penny shaped crack. There's a factor of P over 4. But this means that often the theory of the 2D crack uh, can be used as a first order approximation also partly for these cracks. If you only look in one dim dimension, for instance, and study crack growth, for instance, uh, from bottom to top upward. So here in this experiment, you also see that uh, there are some indications of the stress field. And everybody would expect that this penny-shaped crack is oriented, that it opens in the direction of the minimum uh, compressive stress, the least compressive stress. So, but is it always the case do all fluid field cracks open in this direction? And more important even, do they grow in the direction of, uh, of the maximum compressive stress or in the plane of the maximum and intermediate stress? So what is, what is your guess? What is your opinion? <laughs> Both cases are true. So I will try to show that the first is, is true, but the second one is not necessarily true. And this is um, interesting and important because it uh, yeah, has some implications. So if you want to answer the question in which direction do cracks grow, you need to study the crack tip and the stress intensity factor, but you need a fract uh, fracture criterion. And the typical or the valid criterion or established one is the Griffith criterion. It can be given in this term as, as seen here which we use actually if, you, if, you, if we do numerical simulations, uh, stating that um, if we define the strain energy that is released with increasing this crack, a small amount, um, by this term, so energy change with length, then the fractal criterion would, would, be, would state that this has to be larger than the specific threshold, which is the surface energy that is needed to create a small extension of this existing crack. Um, and additionally, you can, you can uh, require or you can ask that this should also be maximal if you want to define the direction of growth. So an alternative, what is more used in the engineering uh, community, is simply uh, is a, is a criterion based on the stress intensity factor, um, stating that uh, the crack becomes instable if the stress intensity factor is larger, becomes larger than a uh, material property that is the fracture toughness, and the fracture toughness is related then to the surface, to the specific surface energy. But the formulation in terms of energy release is, is more interesting if you really want to understand how cracks grow and maybe if they curve or do not curve, because the second one can only show you whether a crack is stable or not, but do not tell you exactly in which direction the crack will grow. So if you want to, then we, we can estimate this um, um, strain energy, for instance, if we know the opening shape of the crack and we know the driving stress, we have a normal and a shear component, so it's a sum of both, and we can integrate over the whole crack surface. This gives the strain energy, and the strain energy change with length is then simply this uh, first order approximation, and it's the, the, the difference between the energy in two stages divided by the length increase. And this is related to the stress intensity factor, as you see here. So numerically, 
you can posit, you can, for instance, solve this if you have a method that can estimate for a given driving stress the opening shape of the Greg. You can simply test. You increase length by a, by a unit step, and you can test. You can estimate, calculate the opening, and then calculate the strain energy, form the difference as by this formula, and then try to understand when is it maximum in which direction, and then uh, whether your fracture criteria is fulfilled, and then you can uh, simulate crack growth. And we've, I've done this long time ago, and take some examples from this uh, paper at this time, uh, which are, I think, quite instructive. Um, simply simulations, how do cracks go? And we start with empty cracks. So you see um, this should, uh, should be an air-filled or empty crack. And if you put it in a, in a crust at larger depth and you have confining pressure, compressive stress uh, from all sides, and there's no deviatoric stress, then this crack would do nothing. It would still be addressed and would not start to grow because the fracture criteria is not fulfilled. If you put it in an extensional regime, poorly extensional, for instance, close to the surface, it might happen in a volcano sl slope, for instance, that you have really extensional stresses. Then this empty crack would start to grow, and it would grow in, in its own plane if there's no deviatoric stress here in this medium, and it would not stop to grow. It would grow un until uh, infinity if you, if you don't change the stress field. If you have a mixed load, so, uh, so there's shear stress uh, present, then you can observe that the growing is in direction of the maximum compressive stress, as you see here by this arrow. So the crack turns and grows in this direction, but then grows until infinity. Um, if you fill this crack with fluids, and you assume that this is a finite volume crack, then the figure changes a bit for these simulations in the overall compressive um, regime. This would also be stable, but the opening is not zero. It is a finite value because there's fluid inside that is compressed until the boundary conditions is, is fulfilled. And you have uh, equivalence of the internal and the outernal uh, normal stress. If you have it in an extensional regime, this crack would also grow in its own plane. But after a while, it stops because you have a decompression with volume increase. So. This would not grow to infinity, and if it's a mixed load, it would, it would also it turn, as you see here, and then at, after, after a while, it would stop. Interesting is also that this turning here is different. If it's an empty crack, it's a sharp, like a, nearly a kink, but it's still a smooth curve, but this curvature here has a much larger curvature radius if it's uh, fluid-filled. And this also already tells something um, on the growth path there is a difference, and this difference actually comes from the, what I call self-stress of the crack. So what is, what is this with the fluid field crack? What is different? In the fluid field crack, you assume that you have a finite volume crack, so this is a closed system and the fluid cannot disappear. If you make this assumption, then um, yeah, the internal pressure um, can vary, can change. It is always trying to be in, in uh, to fulfill the boundary conditions with elastic media. And you can, uh, in principle, for instance, if the crack grows, here are two examples of such how such growth can look like: unilateral or bilateral, from a highly overpressurized crack to a uh, to a normal overpressurized crack. Uh, then the the um, volume would possibly change. What is constant is the fluid mass, but the Fluid volume can slightly change and can change according to the compressibility or of the fluid, the internal pressure. So this is the ambient pressure in the crack can change. It can adapt to the environmental ambient stress. And this is an important concept for fluid field cracks if they are of fine volume. So you can continue with these uh, simulations. And for instance, uh, study the effect of Stress gradients. Stress gradients means that, as seen as in this figure, for a poorly compressional stress regime, but you have no deviatoric stress, no shear stress involved, but overall the stress is larger here and smaller here. For instance, there's a volcanic load, and if you go away from the volcanic load, you have an inhomogeneous stress field, maybe you have stress gradients. If this crack would grow here, and we make simulations, we see that um, it is not growing in its own plane, as we have seen before, but it is curving 
in the direction of the maximum gradient of the stress. So the gradient has an influence of the strain energy release, and therefore this is turning. But it's an, um, this turning depends on the volume in, enclosed in this crack. And it's uh, very smooth if this is a large volume crack, which finally would mean this is a dike with, uh, that is very long and has a large volume. And it's, uh, it is the opposite if it's a small volume crack. More interesting is if you have a deviatoric stress and a gradient, as you see here. So the, the axis in this direction and in this direction of the remote stress is, are not the same. So maximum compressive stress is in this direction, up down in this figure. The gradient is in horizontal direction. So the gradient only would try to, to turn the crack in this direction. The, the deviatoric stress would try to turn the crack in this direction. Overall, it takes some path in between. It means, it answers already this question, it's not always uh, growing in direction of maximum compressive. There are reasons, for instance, stress gradients that can, can lead to a deviation of this uh, direction. And it also means that this is a crack uh, propagating or growing under mixed mode loading. There's also shear, mo shear motion involved. It's not only opening. And sometimes we observe, we, we observe this in, uh, for instance, in rifting episodes. And maybe gradients can also be a reason for, for this. Um, if the gradient and the com maximum compressive would, would um, point or uh, be in the same direction, the crack immediately turns in this direction and, and moves in this way. Um, we, we also see another um, feature here that is the, the crack itself has moved as a whole, and uh, so wholesale movement, or crack propagation, as we sometimes call it. And this is maybe better explained if in the next figure when we come to buoyancy-controlled cracks. But I, I also like this figure because it's, uh, it's a very extreme simulation. But here, I changed not only the uh, gradient as before, and to have some shear stress, but <coughs> the shear stress is also increasing in this direction. And then you see that in comparison to this figure where it simply turns and, and grows in this direction, there is, according to this numerical stream, also a, a mode of crack growth that is poorly shear in principle. Also, it's a mixed mode. So it's still fluid filled, opening, but, there, but growing in a shear direction because shear stress is so large. So it, it is uh, maybe not so. Yeah, this is a theoretical result, and I have no example where this has been observed. It is so clear so far. But coming now to, to another uh, question, this is this wholesale movement. It can happen if you have lateral gradients of stress, as we have already seen in the simulation, but it's much easier to explain if you have uh, ascent of dikes. And uh, Claude Chopin yesterday already showed this example and explained very well the, the theory behind the gradient of the driving stress in this case comes from the density difference and from the apparent buoyancy. It's not a true buoyancy force, uh, but it's an apparent buoyancy because responsible for the growth is always the strain energy release. So this figure has been discussed by Glo Chopin. You see the, uh, this is, let's say, the, the driving stress uh, as the difference between the, um, the, the ambient stress in the rock which changes with depth and the internal stress gradient from the density column above. And if the density is smaller than the density of rock, the density of the fluid is smaller than that of rock, there is an overpressure at the top. And at the bottom, well, at some point, the pressure is zero or the driving stress is zero. And, and if you go deeper, it will even be uh, under pressure, lower pressure internal than outside. And then you can find an opening shape that, uh, that is plotted here, which is this teardrop shape. And this uh, is, is a well-known solution, the so-called uh, Wertmann solution. Uh, and, and in this mode, uh, this is very interesting because here at the top, we will see or uh, can show that the stress intensity factor is exactly zero, uh, while here it can be very large. So the rock can break on top and on, bottom, on the bottom end, on the lower tip, it would, uh, the crack would have would try to close itself, uh, even if there is uh, a channel that is left behind him, 
and this is thought to be the, the mode of dike growth, dike ascent from bottom to top. Um, this was all for a 2D solution for this type of Griffith crack, but you can also simulate how, how it would change if you, if you go to penny-shaped cracks. And in principle, you, can, you have the same shape. There's only a small change in the internal overpressure before we had a factor of 0.5. And if you go to this 3D Greg, it's 0.7 about uh, of the length, the half length of the Greg times this gradient. Maybe you see here again, the, 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 this function is defined as an ambient stress. This is the one that adapts. And the gradient, this is uh, depending on the, on the uh, density difference. So we can also understand the growth of penny-shaped crack or the opening of penny-shaped cracks. And if they are in this mode, they would break the rock on top, leave a channel behind. And you can also simulate this. And it was often, for instance, observed very well by, by Eleonora and uh, described in some papers in, in, for gelatine cracks. You can observe this mode of wholesale upward moving of crack propagation uh, for these cracks in gelatine. And, uh, and you can simulate this here with a boundary element method can simulate the opening shape, and you see then the, the channel behind um, that, that is uh, the path of the crack. And this was the dashed line we have seen in the figures before. This is, let's say, the, the theoretical solution of such a growing crack. And it's clear that this crack will also change the stress field in the surrounding. And, and this has also been simulated with this boundary element method. And you see through cross, three cross sections, one is a um, horizontal plane and two vertical planes. So this is the, the plane we have seen before. This is uh, orthog orthogonal to this. And you see that there are large Coulomb stress changes, mainly at the crack tip. And if you would think on which earthquakes would they induce, um, then you can recognize that the mechanism of the earthquakes can change a lot. The stress field is very inhomogeneous if such a crack propagates uh, upward. So you can explain normal faulting uh, thrust faulting, and also partly shear faulting events in, in such an environment. So the expectation for earthquakes in the surrounding rock is that because of the heterogeneous stress field that the mechanism can vary a lot. Um, yeah, another question. We have only looked to stability, but it's clear a, a, a big question, a key question is also how fast do these cracks grow and move uh, wholesale. And this is more difficult to, to understand and to find uh, theoretical solutions. But uh, in principle, the idea is that yeah, the fluid has to move during the growth of the fracture. So maybe it, it moves upwards here and, and, uh, yeah, and downwards at, at the side. If in this presentation, and the flow causes some viscous pressure drop, and this would cause during flow that the overall pressure uh, in the crack will be reduced. But if you try to simulate this, it's an approximation. But anyway, um, the, the result uh, mainly shows that overall this gradient is reserved. So the opening shape should be the same. It's only the ambient pressure that is on most part of this crack reduced, except of the crack tip, which is a singularity for the flow and uh, where you have to introduce some approximations and, and where uh, yeah, this simple move of the internal stress field will change. So I will not go more in the, in the theory of this flow uh, and velocity of growth, but we, we have, for instance, lab experiments to compare theories with this. For instance, these gelatine cracks, and you can see that the flow velocity, the growth velocity, or ascent velocity is larger if the length of the, of the crack is larger, meaning also the stress intensity factor at the top is larger. Then the growth velocity is larger here. It's, it's the growth velocity of such a crack in a gelatine experiment is plotted as a function of time. And it's smaller if the volume of fluid embedded in this crack is smaller. So in, in terms of dikes, it means a very long dike would ascend faster than a very small one. But it's also interesting, and therefore I include this figure, also it's a bit complex, that all this theory would also predict that, the, it, that you need a critical length of the crack until it starts to grow. This is coming from the fracture criterion. 
uh, and we have seen that the stress intensity factor depends on the length, um, meaning the stress singularity depends also on the length of the crack, and only if the length is so large that you meet this criterion, the crack would grow. And you can try to estimate how large could this be for magma dikes, for water fill dikes, and it differs a lot. For magma fill dikes, it can be in the range of kilometers, actually. Depending on the level in the crust where you simulate this, so this was a simulation for dikes in the mantle. Um, and then the velocity um, at the point of the critical length of the crack is very small in the beginning, but it accelerates quickly if the crack becomes longer. If there is a mechanism to fill in more fluids than the critical amount of fluid, it can grow, grow fast. But there is also the option that they grow very slow. You cannot really know this. Um, and overall, the growth velocity, the ascent velocity for dikes is in the range of meters, centimeters to 10 meters per second. So this can be typical velocities, growth velocity of dikes. So we have um, then used this and simulated several um, examples. But I, I possibly will go very quick over this, because uh, I think also Elena Nora will also um, show some more examples, possibly, <laughs> in her presentation. But only, so you see some figures um, to show the, the principal effects of these uh, simulations of a fracture, whole cell fracture movement. You can, you can try to simulate uh, how Greg ascends in a, in a crust. Let's say this is the crust, this is the mantle for coming from the deep mantle. Uh, a dike uh, with a density of uh, given here 2,950 in a in a mantle with 3,300 kilogram per cubic meter, and in the crust the density is smaller. So you have the so-called level of neutral buoyancy here, and the um, let's say the the effective uh, driving s stress in principle or this gradient of the of the stress profile in, in the rock is seen here. Um, the one in the, in the, so the presentation is always that the one in the, in the dike would be simply vertical because it's a reduced scale. So you see this crack would grow and it would stop here. This is then the stopping point because of the level of neutral buoyancy. This is in a stress field that has no deviatoric stress. But this can change if you go to a extensional regime or compressional regime in the crust. If you go to an extensional regime, you, in principle, observe the same, except that maybe the crack uh, intrudes a bit shallower and becomes a bit longer. But this actually is the, is the situation that has been described yesterday by Claude Chopin. In this situation, this crack in this stress field would have a tendency to uh, grow, continue to grow laterally, but still be a vertical dike. If you have a compressional stress field, you can turn the, the, the crack into the dike, into sills. But whether and at which level they turn depends, again, on this volume that is entrapped in these cracks. So if they are long dikes or short dikes, have a large volume, small volume, you can, you can break through the zone of compressional stress if it's a very large volume dike, even if you are in, in such a stress regime. So this can explain, for instance, magmatic underblating in the crust in, an, in a compressional stress environment. You can study the loading effect of, of a mountain, of a volcano, and you see that the paths plotted here have the tendency to attract dikes, which can explain the formation of volcanic centers. Um, or in a compressional regime, you would uh, see even with this uh, loading um, from, a, from a mountain, these uh, dikes would not reach the very shallow surface, but would accumulate in a, in a deeper level and possibly can explain the formation of dikes. And this is a work by uh, Francesco and Eleonora, recently, for instance, studying the effect of grabens, which have, has the opposite effect as one from, from mountains in principle. But there's much more you can learn than, um, and Eleonora will show this. Uh, possibly in, in her talk a bit better. You can um, also study um, and try to investigate what would happen in the mantle. If you have a mantle flow, the mantle flow would change the stress field. And you would um, 
And, and you can explain, for instance, in a, in a subduction zone where this is the subducting slab, this is the mantle wedge above, above the subducting slab. If you use analytical solutions of this mantle flow and the stress field that is involved in this mantle flow, you find that the fluid field drags would have a tendency to move away from the subduction zone, if these drags are generated here, and to reach the surface or shallow levels uh, in some distance to the dredge. Also something that is uh, observed, that volcanic chain usually is, is offset in comparison to the, to the subducting trench, and this offset has a characteristic length always where the, where the subducting slab is in a rate is about 100 kilometer deep. Uh, and this mechanism possibly can explain that fluid filled drags have a tendency to move in this direction. This includes also water filled drags, but also magmatic dikes. Also at mid-ocean ridges, you can simulate the, the drag dike growth in the mantle, and you find that there's, again, an attraction point, not from the load, but also from the, only from the mantle flow at mid-ocean ridges. And it's interesting that this solution was, was presented from the assumption that you have dike ascent mechanism, as we have explained <coughs> just before, is very similar to the mechanism that comes out from uh, another model that is porous flow of magmas. So they also have the same tendency. So in principle, from the observation, you would not be able to distinguish these two models. So these are the, the basics of isolated single cracks. But it's clear, I think, to everyone that there's also a lot of crack of interaction possibly that can take place. And this will also change partly the, the growth mode of these or the growth path of these cracks. And a very well-known example is, is this of a crack crack interaction, because there are many uh, expressions in geology. This is a, a photo of a, of a mud layer that has been dried in the sun. And you see these features. And this is an interaction of two opening cracks um, overlapping. And actually, I just looked here. Here you see a very nice crack in this wall. <laughs> And you can, uh, you can see the same features here, overlapping cracks growing in this, in this ball. <laughs> and uh, you, you can also observe this for dike segments, as seen here in this, in this figure on a small scale. Uh, and we have seen the crack scale. But also for, for mid-ocean like ridges, you see these overlapping spreading centers. So this is, a solu this is an effect of the interaction of the two cracks. And these numerical simulations can reproduce exactly this shape. Well, it's actually it's not so different. I mean, it's uh, if you have a if you have a lateral dikes like these mid-ocean ridges, you can assume they they are have a length cutting the whole plate of crust, and then it's basically a 2D problem. If you have really 3D ascending dikes, they can also interact. And then it simply depends on they have a finite length in the in the third dimension. It will depend on whether they overlap or not. And the two dikes in the photo, for example, like you and you would suggest that they join together. Well, actually, I mean, this is uh, this is the example I had to to show this in, in a dike outdrop. And this is a kind of anoshalo dikes. The dike below is is a larger feature, but also these. Segments, these initial segments growing slowly upwards, but growing at the same time horizontally, they show these overlapping features partly. You can also model yeah, the, this interaction by assuming um, what happens if you, have, if you have a dike that solidifies or in some level in the crust. And then you have a second dike and a third dike. And they all feel the stress field that has been created by the first dike, the second one, the third one. And it's interesting, then, that this overall creates a stress field that finally uh, leads to, this is exaggerated, this is a true scale, leads to an accumulation of dikes. And is very similar to what you would uh, observe for a, a magmatic, a spherical magmatic body, so the stress field that comes out. So it can explain that multiple dike intrusions over a long time can lead to a stress field. and Led finally to the formation of magma chambers. Uh, here, this is, is not yet the figure of the stress field, but it shows the surface effect. So it, it can explain the, the formation of volcanic centers and even some periodicity in volcanic centers, for instance, along a, a mid-ocean ridge. 
and here this is a, a plot of the stress field. So you see that maximum compressive stress is, is more or less um, similar to what you would expect from an overpressurized um, spherical source. So this was mainly now so far on the, I have to check the time. Um, yeah, so this was mainly on the, on the growth of, um, of on the ascent of single dikes or partly interacting dikes, we have, but we have never considered the source, the magma source. Uh, this is another problem um, where the growth is controlled by the injection of fluids. And there can be different examples, as I said. There can be the lateral intrusions fed by magma reservoirs, rifting episodes. We think also that we see possibly these effects for, for mid-crustal earthquake swarms, for instance, in northwest Bohemia or in other regions, uh, or very classical hydro, hydraulic fracturing experiments is, is an experiment of an injection and a fluid field growth. And we start with the hydraulic fracturing experiment because the model that I show here has been derived exactly for this case to understand hydrofracturing. And we, and we worked a bit on this. Uh, the, there's no magma chamber. There's a drill hole usually. It's indicated here. And this is packed. Um, and then you have a high overpressure to, inter, to create a hydrofrac that grows in two directions, typically. And uh, we were especially interested in the, in, in the observation that partly this growth is asymmetric. So in one direction, it grows faster than in the other direction. So the two wings of the hydrofrac are possibly not symmetric. It's asymmetric in terms of length. And the possible reason for this is that there are also stress gradients present, as you see in this sketch here, driving stress gradients. This can be buoyancy related, but they can also be related to the background stress. Or in a gas field, as we will see in the example, it can be possibly related to the pore pressure change in the gas field, in the porous matrix. And then it's interesting that, that after you shut off, uh, you close your valve and you, you stop the injection, there is an aftergrowth of these cracks. First bidirectional, but then it can also happen if you have gradients that this is unidirectional, aftergrowth. And this is a very simple model that has been derived. But it's, it, it explains already very well several features uh, you can observe, um, as you will show, uh, as you will see here. And the principal, principal assumption is, is maybe best explained with these sketches, where you see different stages of this injection process, the injection phase. And if for a hydrofrac, you can do it very simple that you say the injection pressure is always the same during the injection phase. It's controlled by humans. And then the crack grows. And this is the upper, the A part of this figure. The length of the crack is seen here. The injection point is at zero. And the pressure um, profiles are plotted here. And this is the limiting, uh, let's say, pressure that is needed to further grow as soon as this black profile, which is the effective pressure, or what I called that driving pressure before, reaches this, this threshold, uh, this defines the tip of the crack. And the gradient, so the no flow or background driving stress is without flow is seen here. This is what Klo part uh, mentioned with uh, the static solution, hydrostatic solution in principle. Um, so introducing a flow, you, you have to consider that there's a, a viscous pressure, viscous uh, pressure drop related to the viscous flow and the pressure track there. And you, if you uh, approximate this to a first order by a linear law, then you have, you have this linear uh, equi uh, lines as you see here. <clears throat> this is and leading to the effective pressure, over pressure in the crack during the process of growth. So we use this, we use this laminar flow approximation for this linear viscous pressure drag and try to estimate the velocity and the length of these cracks. And it's possible to find analytical solutions that have been described in detail in this, in this paper. I will, not, I will not go into details of the derivation. It would take too much time. But it's all published in 2010. Um, but interesting, more interesting is to look now what, what is the concept after you stop the injection. Then you relax the boundary condition that the 
injection pressure is at the injection point always P naught. So it, and the crack continues to grow because, uh, as, uh, because you still have the possibility of flow and, and fulfilling the fracture criteria to both sides. But the ambient pressure would quickly decrease because of the expansion of the crack. The internal pressure will decrease quickly. So this is an interim phase which is not lasting very long. But if there are these stress gradients present, after a while, after this point, this, the crack would not, if the red line is at this level, the crack would not grow further in the short wing direction. So growth would stop here, but in the other side, the crack can still grow. And, and then you have this situation. This is the post-injection phase with a, oh, this is wrong, with a unidirectional growth. And only in one direction, the ambient pressure still decreases until you finally will have the red point here. And then you are in the situation as before, more or less with the Batman crack and, the, and maybe the crack stops or it slows or it grows very slowly wholesale in a wholesale movement mode so we so in the first phase trying to, to with this analytical model it's interesting that you can find solutions for the length of the two wings as a function of time they also depend on the on the, the so the exact shape of this um, long wings and short wings growth depends on the viscosity also on, on some other assumptions um, but the ratio between the long and the short wings is independent of viscosity and only depends on the injection pressure and the pressure gradient so if you can measure during a hydrofrac experiment the two wings as a function of time in, the, in such a curve and you you can form this ratio and you can estimate the gradient and the internal pressure in the injection phase, during the injection phase. And it's interesting to ask whether this can possibly uh, adapted or used also for magmatic intrusions, um, if you can measure by seismicity the length of these two wings. Um, in the post-injection phase, where you have this redistribution of pressure and only growth in one direction, there's also a, a self-similar solution um, with this analytical model, and this tells that the extension at the point when, when the crack stops to grow in one direction and only grows in, in, the, third, in the second direction of the long wing, um, then it extends further. But the overall extension is always 1.5 of the length that has been reached um, just in the moment when it starts to grow unilateral instead of bidirectional. The shape, how quick it, it reaches this value here, depends on on other parameters. Um, but the the overall extension is always 1.45, independent of any parameter. So it's a good test of the model, whether this model is valid. But it also gives an, an, an option, for instance, for a magmatic intrusion from a reservoir, if you can measure the overall length, that you can try to estimate the stop of the injection period um, in terms of length, but also in terms of time. So I, I think I should summarize here the, um, the findings for fluid field crack growth. And I'm a bit afraid that, that, that I have not much time to show examples of, uh, of seismicity in these last 10 minutes. But, but first, summarize what, we have, what I explained here. So fluid field crack growth is controlled by three factors overall. One is the orientation of the least compressive stress. This is a, a strong factor. This is also what is classically uh, assumed to be the main factor or the only factor. But there is also an effect of effective driving stress gradients. This can be buoyancy or can be gradients in the, in the, um, in the background stress. And the third one I've, you've seen in the simulations is the self-stress that is generated by the cracks. Um, they, if, the, if the crack is long, if it has a large opening, the stress uh, inhomogeneity created by the crack himself is, is very large and is always at the tip. And it influences the overall stress field. And this leads to the smooth curvature. And it's changing if you have a large volume crack or a small volume crack. Um, 
And this also controls the path. For instance, we have seen yesterday, Glotropa showed this nice example of the ship rock ex, uh, ex intrusions, which were exposed. And you see the path of many dikes. And if you look to the original figure of this geological study mapping all these, you see some, some dike paths crossing the others, which if all would happen, let's say, at the same time, you would not expect this. But it possibly can also be an influence of the overall um, pressure in the intrusion, um, because the path, if it turns, is different if the volume is not the same. So something that has to be kept in mind. So the, the growth is also influenced by the crack-crack interaction. And this, for instance, can be used to understand or to study lo localized volcanic centers. Um, another point I have not mentioned is that crack-crack interaction can also lead to stopping of cracks. If you have a sill mm -hmm. and a dike reaching the sill, it will immediately stop. It's, in principle, a crack-crack interaction problem. And it's also a second mechanism to form reservoirs. Um, and then we have seen that the penny-shaped crack um, is, is, a, is a, also a basic solution. Um, I've not really shown, but, uh, but uh, only indicated in the figure, that it's not only always circular. It can also be elliptical. And this depends a bit on the intermediate stress and the change of the intermediate stress to the, to the maximum compressive stress. But the penny-shaped crack is very much related also to this Werfmann crack, where you start from a penny-shaped crack, and this is growing in one direction and, and leaving a channel behind. So the whole wholesale movement of an overcritical crack is an is a important solution. And you can explain these uh, yeah, vertical dikes and horizontal sills uh, that are moving as a whole if you have effective uh, stress gradients. And then also the injection related figure in the last uh, examples I've given show, have shown or I tried to show that, that asymmetric crack growth is possible, bilateral growth, but not with the same speed in two directions. And the time function depends on the uh, fracture toughness, so this rock parameter, but also on the fluid viscosity. If you can measure the time function very precisely, you, you have a chance to estimate these parameters from these experiments. Um, but the ratio of the long and the short wing depends only on the stress gradient and gives a, a good option to try to estimate these parameters. This parameter, and after the injection, you have this self-similar solution for first bilateral and then unilateral expansion with this interesting result that the overall expansion is always 1.5 the length of the, of the length of the, at the end of the injection phase. Which, which is also a, an interesting feature. Um, and the last point I mentioned here, I have to read it myself, crack opening and stress buildup in rock explains bilateral front of seismicity during injection um, and the front of back front of seismicity. This is something I've not yet shown here. And actually, I wanted to make this in gray because this is something um, maybe if I have three minutes more, five minutes which I can, can directly show in, in one example, um, which is coming next. I have in the presentation, I will, I will give you, I have some basic things on seismicity, how it is created. But since Cindy will um, show examples on this anyway, I have many slides that are shadowed. And here are these examples. How does it? So we can see one example, or two examples maybe quickly, for, th for this injection control fracturing. So this, is, uh, this shows the basic principle. And the experiment I will show has a similar geometry. Um, you have a an, an borehole. You have a hydrofrac there, and this is observed from other boreholes, for instance, with seismometers, so, you, so that you can measure the seismicity. Then there is a penny-shaped crack growing. And if you plot the distance to the injection point versus the occurrence time, you see the growth of the crack tip in principle, because there the stressing rate is, is larger. And most of the seismicity is occurring there. But you already see 
if you refract that there are no earthquakes occurring here, this is a typical stress shadow effect. And in the next slide, we, are, we, we, we use the same experiment, but on a larger scale in a gas field, where you here see the borehole, and they have been different stages of hydrofrac experiments. This is the, um, in colors are different stages, so experiments at different times, different packers, and if we concentrate only in blue one here, and we plot the direction of size, the, the distance of seismicity in this plane to the injection point, you will see in this distance time plot this asymmetric growth, but you also see it here, most of the seismicity is in one direction and not in the other direction. And it was confirmed that this is not a location problem. It's really a fact that the, the growth was asymmetric. So if you, if you plot for such a stage the distance over time, you see here the seismicity cloud. And then you see, and we know the injection phase was this long. And you see this bilateral growth in the, in the injection phase. And after stopping the injection phase, you see this unilateral growth only in one direction, not in the other direction, stopping here in terms of seismicity. And there's much uh, fewer events occurring here. And this is, uh, and the so-called back front and forefront from this fracture model is indicated here in red and blue lines. And this means um, this is the tip of the crack. And we've seen there's a large stress singularity and, and large stress rates. So you can explain that this is the front of seismicity when it grows. There are many shear cracks occurring in the neighborhood of the crack tip. But then you also have this opening shape, and this changes with time. And at the point where the opening shape is largest, um, and if it moves in one direction, then it closes again behind this opening. And then this can define a point where you have a stress shadow, because it was large opening, then it, 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 it comes smaller. And this you can calculate this, and it, it is estimated here, this blue line. And it, it fits roughly already the observation and the prediction of when it should stop is exactly at this point. And also this is fits very well, this observation of the extension from this point to this point here. So we had this, we confirmed this with a second experiment. It's more or less similar. But there's one problem if you try to interpret seismicity. You, in principle, you see very well. You can make these plots. You can try to figure out what is the front and the back front. But the seismic events are cannot be described in a deterministic way. And you have always some events here. You have some here that in a deterministic world should not occur here because the earthquake generation problem is more difficult. And you need a probabilistic scheme. So you should have a way to translate this FRAG model into um, seismicity, theoretical seismicity occurrence, seismic rates, seismicity rates. And therefore, you need a seismicity model that is based on physics in terms of stress changes. For instance, the rate and state model can do this. And we have tried to do this here from the, from, from the known solution of our analytical field. We, can, we know the internal pressure field in the injection phase, in the post-injection phase. And we can use this as input in a rate and state model. And we can make predictions on the rate of seismicity, how we expect it, and then compare directly to the rate of events. And this is a much better way to compare seismicity to fracture models. And this is here shown in principle for a hydrofrac, but the same approach is, I think, very important to, to go and uh, to do for, for dike intrusions. If you have seismicity, if you want to really uh, learn something on, on the dike itself and the properties of the dike, uh, you should couple all these um, fracture and dike models with the seismicity model and try to compare rates of seismicity with theoretical rates, observed with theoretical rates. OK, I think I, I stop here because my time is over for now. Is there any relationship with the manual distribution of this is a uh, very hot topic. <laughs> and there is. Also, Paul Siegel has, has worked on this. The magnitude. I, if I talk about rates of events, I, I, it's another subject uh, as the, the magnitudes. And the most simple assumption is always that you assume that you have a, freak, uh, a gutenberg richter magnitude distribution, a normal frequency magnitude distribution. You can. You can apply this to your model. 
and then you can already f compare it. But it's uh, high, it's it's debated at the moment if this is maybe too simple, um, and more sophisticated models, um, for instance, try to distinguish between poorly triggered models and induced models. So there's always a kind of background seismicity that you can expect or faults that are pre-existing that have already shear stress and that can be triggered. Uh, so rupture can be triggered on these faults and these earthquakes can grow very large. And, uh, and you have the stress field that you only produce because of the, of the dike or the hydrofrac itself. And earthquakes generated by this process, they would stop after they reach the, the end of the stress field that is perturbed. So they would not grow very large, meaning they would produce only small earthquakes and the other concept would, would allow also for larger earthquakes. So, so a modern view is to try to combine these two aspects. But, but it's still a matter of debate as far as I know and there's no established model to really explain the, the magnitude distribution completely. These were very small events. They were measured from boreholes and, 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 and not from the surface. And uh, yeah, typical, I don't know exactly here. now. I don't remember, but, but they are in the range of uh, below zero, one or below zero, so in, in this range, so very small events. Uh, if we Yeah, maybe I, I should have mentioned this also. It's clear that this can also, for instance, stop a dike and influence the growth, the heterogeneities in, in the rock. Um, I think it's important, um, but especially in a region when the overpressure is, is not very large and the, the dike is growing very, very slowly, then, then you, you will also see influences from the, from the rock and the heterogeneities. If you think on a, it's a bit similar to here the, these hydrofrac experiments. If you think to the ejection phase, also for a, for a rifting episode, and the overpressure is really large, I think the dike will not care too much about the heterogeneities in the rock, because the self-stress, for instance, is so large that it simply goes through many things. I think it, it also holds for the reactivation in principle, where, where you would assume that this fracture toughness is more or less zero. In that case, the but the Yes, the, the dike will be larger. It's easier to reactivate it. So let's say you need a smaller internal pressure to reactivate it. In principle, you can compare this maybe with a hydro frac experiments where you have the first frac, and then you have a refrac, where you refrac in, in the pre-existing crack. And, 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 this is, uh, it, and you can measure the pressure, and you can find that the re-injection pressure is smaller. It's not the same as the as the first one to to fracture the origin rock, and the same would would also be for natural processes. I, th I think the answer is yes and no. Both can happen. It's, it, it's a bit the same as we have discussed before. It depends uh, on, the, 
on the material injected and on the overall or the internal overpressure. If this effect is much larger than the effect from structural heterogeneities, then possibly it will not follow this, but it but it definitely will follow a pre-existing crack if if you are in a in a low pressure internal low pressure regime, let's say. Maybe it's it's better. Uh, or it's interesting to compare magmatic intrusions with cold fluid intrusions. So the difference is if you if the critical length is much much smaller. If you think on hydrofrax and and you think on the process that you have a wholesale movement of water filled cracks or gas filled, they are much smaller in length, only 100 meters or, or even less maybe. And the opening is very small. It's in, uh, in micrometer range. So you cannot easily see. And, th and this also means the stress, the self-generated um, stress is not very large. And these fluid field cracks very likely follow pre-existing faults very much. While if you have a magmatic intrusion with, a, in extreme case, uh, several meters of opening, the, the, the stress generated by this intrusion is so large that possibly it will simply cut a fault and, and do not go through. Yes, I'm sorry, but we need to move to Thank you.